For this video, we're really close to finishing talking and introducing uh, the majority of the concepts related to electric potential. Obviously, we'll come back and refer to that a lot more uh, going forward. But one of the last things that we're going to talk about specifically related to it, uh, uh, voltage and electric potential, is the idea of grounding. Now, um, you have probably heard that term before. Um, if you've ever worked with any kind of electronics or if you've ever just looked at a plug uh, for an electrical outlet, you'll notice that on a three-prong plug, you've got the two prongs on top and then you've got this round prong on the bottom that acts as what's called the ground connection. And you might have heard this term before just you know, somewhere out in the world. And maybe you know what it means, maybe you don't. So what we're going to do is look at the concept of grounding as it relates to physics uh, and give an explanation as to why it is an important feature of most electrical circuits and really anything to do with electricity. Grounding is, is very essential um, particularly for us as a safety aspect. Um, so in the previous example, we talked about the fact that uh, voltage and electric fields uh, were obviously related to one another. We talked about the electrical fields or the electric field and voltage for a charged metal sphere. And so we're going to revisit the idea of the metal sphere as an, ana as an analogy for describing what would happen for any kind of a charge system. And in order to do that, we're going to take a look at an arrangement of two spheres. Okay, We've got a big sphere, we've got a little sphere, both of which are made up of a certain amount of uh, metal. So you've got a big metal sphere, a little metal sphere, and they are initially disconnected. We will say that this sphere has a char or it has a radius which we will call r1 and the little sphere has a radius which we will call r2 so r1 is obviously going to be larger than r2 so we can even write that over here just as a mathematical way of saying it r1 is greater than r2 okay um, let's say that they have charges on their surface okay um, we will say that um, they're positively charged, not necessarily the same amount. One could have more charge than the other or less charge and vice versa. The only thing that we really know is the, is the relative size and that they are both charged. Okay, And we'll say that big sphere over here has a charge of Q1 and little sphere over here has a charge of Q2. Let's take these two spheres and connect them. We will take a wire made of some material that's conductive, and we will attach these two spheres together with this wire. Or at the very least, we'll touch the wire to both sides of the sphere at the same time. Now, I want you to think through what is going to happen in this instance. Okay? We know nothing about the relative amounts of charges on either one of these spheres before they're connected. Q1 could be greater than Q2. Q2 could be greater than Q1. Q1 and Q2 could be equal to one another. We don't necessarily know. But we do know what will happen if we attach a wire. Okay? Our logical process in which we thought about um, conductive materials, we talked about conduction of charges, Okay, the fact that charges will move and try to spread themselves out as evenly over um, a surface as possible also applies to the distribution of charges on different, surface that, different surfaces that are attached. We won't consider the surface of the wire. Um, it's, just a, it's just like a bridge from getting from one place to the other. So we touch the wire to both sides, take the wire off. What has happened? Well, the charges have distributed themselves evenly over the surfaces. Well, what do we mean evenly over the surfaces? Does that mean that we're going to have the same amount of charge over here as we have over here? No. And I want you to think about why that would be. Okay? Charges try to evenly space themselves. So let's say that we've got just a, a huge excess of charge over here. Let's say like five coulombs of charge on this sphere. But we've only got one coulomb of charge on this sphere over here. When we attach the wire to both sides, what is going to happen? Well, all of this excess charge, all this charge will be like, hey, there is a lot more room on that sphere. We can get even further away from each other. 
if we just move a portion of ourselves over there. We can't move too many because then we'll be crowded again and we'll want to move back. So the charges will find their way across both surfaces such that they are evenly distributed based on the relative surface area of these spheres. One way that I like to think about it is that when you attach the wire, you essentially add the collective areas, the collective surface areas of both of those spheres together, and the charges will give themselves an equal amount of distribution. Um, to say, for example, that one electron might occupy one cubic, or sorry, not one cubic, one square centimeter of surface area. It probably, it's gonna be a lot less than that. Um, but you get the idea that it tries to evenly spread itself out. When they attach, and the surfaces essentially become one in an electrical sense, not in a physical sense, but in an electrical sense, what happens to the voltage? What happens to the relative electric potential on the surface of these spheres? As it turns out, the voltages become identical. And we'll hopefully, that'll make more sense as we go forward. But what we can assume is that when the charge of Q1 and the charge of Q2 are connected through this wire, that they will evenly distribute themselves over the surface of both of them such that the voltage of one for sphere one over here is gonna be equal to K Q1 over R1 and voltage of two is equal to K Q2 over R2. Now, initially, before the wire connects these, these equations both work for, for the individual sphere. If, in other words, if I take the wire away, these equations are true. We don't know anything about the sizes of those initially, but we do know the radius. And so if we were to know what those charges were, we'd see the voltages. When you connect them like this, all of a sudden, those charges redistribute themselves such that V1 ends up being equal to V2. The electric potential on the surface of either one of these spheres, when the wire is connected and then either left on there or taken off, means that the voltages are going to be are, are going to be equal to one another. If it's 10 volts here, it's going to be 10 volts there as well. When this happens, this results in a ratio between the charges. So if V1 is equal to V2, then what we get is KQ1 over R1 is equal to K. Q2 over R2. And reminder that Q1 and Q2, or Q1 and Q2, refer to, we're, we're looking at the after scenario. Okay, this is after the wire here has been connected. Ks obviously cancel out, and what we see is a ratio that Q1 over Q2 is going to be equal to uh, R1 over R2. So the ratio between those charges is equal to the ratio of the spheres. And that's kind of an interesting uh, assumption. Mathematically, it makes sense, but, but think about the physical implications. What this says is that the sphere that has the larger radius is going to have a greater proportion of the charge, which also ties in with what we said at the beginning of the video, that the bigger sphere having more surface area means that the charges have more space to spread out, essentially, right? So instead of being confined and locked in a particular place, they could just go anywhere. They could spread out all over the surface of this sphere to the point that all the charge distribution spacings were equal, both on the surface of the first sphere and the second sphere. It tells us that the bigger sphere has a greater electric charge than the smaller sphere. And so let's make assumption for a second that the radius of the big sphere is 10 times the radius of the smaller sphere over here how much more charge will it have on the surface? Well, according to our equation, if R1 is 10 times greater than R2, in order for this to be true, Q1, the charge on sphere one, has to be 10 times the amount. So if there were, for example, um, you know, one centimeter and 10 centimeters, and, it was, and we had a certain amount of charge in coulombs, then we might have, let's say, 10 coulombs and one coulomb, or 10 microcoulombs and one microcoulomb, or, or any variation of that where Q1 is 10 times greater than Q2 in that case. <clears throat> if we connect the two spheres with the wire, we find that 10 elevenths of the small sphere 2's original charge will be transferred uh, to large sphere 1, 
and 1 11th will remain on small sphere 2. Again, we're just using the example of 10 times the radius. We could do this as 5 times the radius, or 26 times the radius, or half the radius, or something like that. The proportions would still be the same. The important thing is that the voltages end up being equal to one another. So charge distributions just happen because, again, the geometry allows it, or, or really the geometry requires it in that case. We could also uh, sort of, again, sort of further refine this by saying that the total sum of these charges, Q1 and Q2, represents the total charge. We can't necessarily say that R1 plus R2 is equal to the total radius. That wouldn't really make sense in that case. But we can, we can reasonably say that uh, Q1 plus Q2 is equal to the total charge in, in the example. So how does this relate to the idea of uh, grounding? Well, when you ground something, what you are essentially doing is taking a wire and attaching two spheres. And by spheres, it could be any number. It doesn't have to be a sphere. It could be an object, for example. Um, if I ground myself, what that means is I am attaching myself to a wire, which is then attached to something which has a much larger surface area and will allow excess charge to flow off of me onto this much bigger object. And so what, in this case, would the bigger object be? Well, you can ground yourself to any number of objects. You could ground yourself to a big metal plate or to um, uh, a building. Or, as is most often the case, you ground yourself to the literal ground. You take a wire and you run it into the Earth. The Earth is a really big sphere. The Earth is a huge sphere which can conduct charge or which can take a certain amount of charge. It has a radius of about 6,400 kilometers or 6.4 million meters. When you attach yourself to the Earth, so let's say, for example, that here's the Earth. And here's me on top of it. I'm a giant. Not really. And then I take a wire, and then I run it to the Earth. And then the symbol that we use for grounding is a series of parallel lines which get smaller, usually in a triangular shape. Just means ground connection. And I attach myself to the Earth. If, for example, I was to be stuck with, uh, or to be, not to be stuck with, to be struck with a, you know, uh, an electric charge, if I was not grounded to something, then the charge has nowhere to flow. There's no path for the charge to take, and so it simply builds up on my body. If I was then to come into contact with something through which the charge would then dissipate, then what happens is I get a shock. Or, in that case, the shock represents the electric charge, the current that is actually passing through me at that particular point. A ground connection can save you in that sense because it allows the charge to essentially take a big, take a, a much preferred path. Instead of passing through your body, it actually passes around you and onto something much larger which can uh, take that amount of charge, the Earth in this case. Um, Oftentimes, it's mistaken that people think that, for example, that uh, if you're driving your car, you're going to be safe in a lightning storm because of the rubber tires that they insulate you from the earth, or, or that somehow it acts as a ground connection of some kind. In that case, that's not really what's happening. We'll, we'll talk more about that in, in, um, in future segments. But uh, a good example of grounding would be if you're using any kind of electronic components, or if you're working on, if you've ever built a, a, a PC, not that most people have built a PC, but for those that have or have ever worked with any kind of electrical circuits or circuitry, you will know that um, you have to have a good ground connection. Otherwise, you risk damaging, um, damaging the electric circuitry by running too much current through it. A ground basically gives it an additional path to say, if you accidentally get shocked or something comes off of it, it can travel into the earth. One other consequence uh, of connecting different size conductors um, is that the E-field lines are going to be denser on the small sphere as compared to the large sphere. So I'll draw it over here to, so you can see it a little bit better. If we think about the fact that the charge is equally spaced on each of these spheres, so you've got, if, like we said, if it's 10 times the radius, it's going to have 10 times the charge. This is one over here. They both have the same voltage. However, if we think about the separation of the field lines on these, what we will find is that on the big sphere, 
they're reasonably spaced out. Okay, so you've got a relatively you've got a you've got an E field of some amount of strength. We don't know if it's weak or strong. We'll just say that it's a certain amount. Okay, so for the E field here. Because you have a proportional amount of charge relative to the radius on the small sphere, what you end up with are field lines which are much closer together. And what did we say close lines represent? Well, we said that the close lines represent a stronger electric field. So as it turns out, while both of these spheres have exactly the same electric potential, this sphere has a much larger electric field. So for example, if we call this E1 and E2, E2 is going to be significantly larger than E1, even as the voltage is the same between them. Again, all you have to do is go back to the equation on the electric field to see why this is versus the voltage equation, which is just kq over r. When we have, for example, the same amount of charge. So for example, if we look at both of these spheres, okay, this sphere is going to have significantly less charge. Okay? We'll say 10 times less charge. We'll say that the radius here, which we'll call r1, call this r2. If we calculate the strength of E1, E1 is going to be equal to k times q1 divided by r1 squared. E2 is going to be equal to kq2 over r2 squared. Absolute values for those. If we make the assumption, for example, that r1 is equal to uh, 10 times the radius of r2, or that r2 is equal to a tenth of the radius of r1, and we say that q1 is equal to 10 times q2, look what happens when we calculate the individual electric, fi uh, electric field strengths for either one of those. If we substitute in the appropriate values for, say, q1 or q2, we end up with e1 is equal to k times 10 q2 over 10 r2 squared versus e2, or rather I should say versus e2, which is just k, uh, q2 over r2 squared. Look what happens when we actually calculate this number and compare it to E2. We end up with 10 times k times q2 over 100 times rq squared. So we end up with 1 tenth times k q2 over r2 squared. Sorry if that's a little squished. What results is a statement on, sorry, this should be E1. What results is a statement in which E1 is equal to one-tenth the strength of E2, because these two values are exactly the same. This electric field strength is 10 times weaker, because the radius is 10 times larger. But the voltages are still going to be the same, because the ratios of the charges compared to the radius are exactly the same. That's, why, that's, that's how we can say that the voltages are exactly the same in both of those cases. So, uh, uh, an interesting thing to keep in mind, and it might seem kind of trivial to, to make a statement like this to go, okay, well, you know, that's great or whatever. This kind of question has come up on the AP exam before. I have seen it multiple times, and it, and, and it usually trips up students that aren't prepared for it. They get to this point and they see two spheres of different sizes. They don't know how to compare the voltages in the electric fields. They forget these rules that are associated with it. And I'm telling you, this is being able to do a calculation like this is pretty essential. The key things to remember, so the key takeaways from this video. First, two spheres, when attached by a wire, will evenly distribute the charge over the surface. This results in an equal voltage both on the surface and, as we remember from the last video, the same voltage inside of the spheres as well. What this results in is a proportionality between charges and radiuses, or radii. The larger the radius, the more charge it will be able to hold. When we compare the electric fields for either one of those spheres, however, we will find that the smaller the sphere is, in other words, the more curved the sphere, or the curved surfaces at that particular point, 
the larger that electric field strength is compared to the other one. And I forgot to put one there. The larger that electric field strength is, even though the voltages are going to end up being the same as one another. And we can prove that by putting them in, in equal terms, by saying how do the radii compare, how do the charges compare. And again, we can know how the charges compare by the radius because of what we established over here. Okay, so this may be a video that you want to go back, you may want to come back to a couple of times if you're working on these problems in homework, in, in homework sessions or progress checks or whatever it is that you're working on, because this is a really good example to help explain why the electric fields behave the way they do. Last point, again, I know this video is going a little bit long, but I did say that there was going to be some direct application to this. Part of that has to do with grounding. The other part has to do with something that we refer to as a lightning rod. Okay, you probably have heard of a lightning rod or maybe even seen one before. Usually that you put them on top of a house or very large buildings will have lightning rods. The lightning rod is pretty self-explanatory. The idea is that lightning will strike the lightning rod because it is, you know, way up high and it distributes the, and, it, and it keeps it, the, uh, the electrical strike, the lightning strike, from hitting something else unintentionally. In other words, it directs the lightning to a point somehow that keeps it from causing damage to anything else. The way the lightning strike works is because it is pointed. The curvature of the surface at the point causes a very strong electrical field because it is really, really close. The radius, in other words, of the curvature is very small. That point, which causes a buildup or a stronger electric field at that point, is due to the fact that the lightning rod is connected directly to the earth. It's grounded. All of that charge builds up on that point. So when the lightning goes to strike through a process which, to be honest, physicists don't completely understand, the lightning will strike at that particular point because of the much stronger electrical field strength because of that curved surface. So, it, so you could try and make a lightning rod out of a curved surface, but it's always going to be more effective if it is something like a spike or a point that the lightning can actually strike to. So hopefully that was informative. I would encourage you to, if you, if you have some extra time, go look up the, the, the science behind lightning rods and, and lightning strikes. It is a very, very interesting, uh, uh, very, very interesting bit of watching. All right. Thanks, guys. See you in the next video.